Uh, my name's Kelly Byers. I'm the Connections Director here on the Vista Campus. And I am Philip Byers. I'm a life group pastor and live venue pastor. So thanks for being here. Um, man, just even in the first 10 minutes of that Q&A and seeing y'all's hands go up, I felt encouraged and like I'm not the only one. We have, <laughs> know. We have two boys that are 7 and 10. Yes. And we about five or six years ago, we had that, um, what would it have been, two, three, that said no to us all the time. Yep. Uh, that was us that was and us. still is us. And, yeah, um, and we had some friends. We lived in Texas at the time. We had some friends say, hey, you got to check this guy out. He has a podcast, and it's awesome. It's called Celebrate Calm. So about five years ago, we started listening to this podcast. And ever since then, uh, Kirk uh, was the first time we've ever met him and seen him in person, but through podcasts, through a lot, we've bought several of his his kits uh, online that are in that packet. They have been some of the best resources mm -hmm. that we've even seen or heard of. They've helped us so much, and we are nowhere, anywhere close to perfect. We still struggle, probably even on the way here today, but... Anyways, I know. Yeah. It's fun and it's hard and it's challenging. Literally, the one I took him to childcare, the one I thought was going to pitch a fit when he went in walked right in. And the one I thought would walk right in pitched a fit. I'm like, okay. Here we go. This well, is not what... for parenting. Here we I go. I know, yeah. So anyways, we're glad you're here, and um, I don't know if Kirk needs any more introduction, but um, hey, thanks for being with us tonight, and we're, we're And we'll hang out afterwards, too. If you guys have questions, we've purchased several of his products, like Philip said. Uh, we have definitely have a strong-willed child. We have a very compliant child. It makes our household tons of fun. Um, he's got some great products. If um, Like, we, we went through the IEP process this year with our school, um, and that... All the stuff we got from Kirk was tremendously helpful in preparing us for that. Um, and so if you have questions for us, too, about that, we'll hang out afterwards, and we'd love to talk to you, too. But we are so excited, and we thank you for being here, Kirk. All right? Thank you. Round of applause for our host, please. Um, how awful is it to get invited to San Diego? So uh, just do it in the winter next time. So we're on the exact opposite coast, Wilmington, North Carolina, where all the hurricanes hit. Um, so, do I have permission tonight just to be honest and brutal and just to share what I thought? Okay, good. So, because we can all take it, we're adults. I really want to give you help. As you've seen, almost all of you in here, you've got, you're, you're struggling probably with a strong-willed child, right? So, very quickly, the strong-willed child, kind of how we um, uh, describe them. They tend to be very bright kids. They're smart. Not always academically motivated, but they're pretty bright. But they tend to use their intelligence to argue with you, and they will pick out all of your inconsistencies, and they will, um, they're like those cops, judges, and attorneys all wrapped into one. When they wake up in the morning, they have an agenda because they know what they like and they know what they don't like, and what they don't like is anything that you want them to do. So there are power struggles over everything, and you will spend your childhood saying this, if you would just do what I asked you to do, you would be done in seven minutes, but you'd rather argue for seven hours or days or weeks or years and lose everything. Anybody have those kids? Good. And we're going to get to this. Consequences tend not to work with these kids, but the truth is consequences tend not to work with most people. They just don't. If you think about it, a consequence is I'm going to punish you for failing. And if you twist that around, what we'll get to is, what if I know that my child struggles with X, whether it's in school or impulse control, and instead proactively, I gave that child tools to succeed rather than punishing him for failure? Because many of your kids are caught in this nasty cycle of they're in trouble all the time. They show up at school, they're already on red on the behavior chart, and school hasn't even started yet. And so eventually what they say is, if I'm going to be on red today, I may as well just double down and make it a really bad day. Because I'm never getting to green. Because they're not little compliant rule followers, and they will always challenge. And so eventually what happens is they shut down. I will ask you to forgive me ahead of time. Sometimes I use language that isn't always appropriate for a church. I'm not going to drop the F-bomb probably. But at times I will say things because it's what the kids are feeling inside, right? And eventually they shut down and they will say inside, forgive me for this, but screw you. Screw you. Screw teachers. Because nothing's ever good enough for anybody. I'm always in trouble. And you'll hear this. A little bit of this is defensive mechanism. You know, you guys would... Well, this is actually the husband says this. You guys would just be better off without me. 
How many of your husbands, don't raise your hands, but how many of us say that one, right? Because no matter what we do, it's never good enough. And so we get kind of like a big baby and we're like, you know what? I'll just go to work. You handle everything with the kids, right? I say that all the time. But the kids will shut down and say, you guys don't even like me. And they begin to internalize that you have a sibling, a child who's the good child, and then you have your strong-willed child. And if you're not careful, you will end up with Cain and Abel. It's the oldest known story in mankind, and it still happens every day. One child is rejected, and the good kid everybody likes. So um, these kids... I mentioned this before, and I believe it to be true. They're never going to do things the way you want them done. They're not going to do it your way. They're just not. And I know all the men in here are like me, and I don't care if you're six foot four or 250. I'm putting 1000 bucks on your five-year-old because he will own you. I grew up the son of a career military father. In our home, our dad was known as the colonel, so it was a ton of fun growing up. And I had three brothers. My dad only knew fear and intimidation, yelling and screaming. That's all he knew, because that's what his dad did and his dad's dad did. So when my brothers and I grew up and we got married and had kids, guess what we did? Same thing. Yo, how many times do I have to tell you this is very natural to me? Just standing like this, you know what? Cut the crap. That was how I talked to Casey when I was little. Sorry about that. But that comes naturally. And so I spent all my time thinking, you know what, if that kid would just change, if he would just listen to me, and what I realized over time was I needed to change. And when I started to deal with my own issues because I couldn't control my own emotions and I was asking him to, when I started to learn how to control myself, it actually changed him. And so we'll get into this tonight. So let's go ahead. Uh, I want to spend the first about 14 minutes on us. I've got really one huge goal tonight, which is to break generational patterns. My dad's generational pattern that I got from him, yell, scream, fear and intimidation, can't control myself. And you'll see in some of the stories, I was actually dependent on Casey. Sometimes we need our kids to behave because if they don't behave, we can't behave. True? So breaking those generational patterns. Uh, my mom and many of you are like, uh, some of you are like this, it, kind of the martyr mother. I do everything for everybody else and nothing for myself. And we hide it behind this thing of like, oh, I'm so giving. And it's not at all. It's manipulative. That sounded kind of harsh, but it's true. Sometimes we say, after all I do for you. And some of you still have moms who do that. And you know what it is? It's manipulation. Because I've done so much for you, you owe me. Neither of those are healthy, and I want to break those patterns so that our kids don't have to grow up and wrestle with all these issues that we're doing. So the first few minutes, we're going to talk about ourselves. So first key principle is this. There's only one person in life that you can control, and that is whom? Ourselves, right? Secondly, quickest way to change your child's behavior is to first what? Control your own. So here's our quick background. I began to change. I noticed Casey changed. We decided, because uh, Casey was very, very strong-willed, came out of the womb with boxing gloves on. And so I had this idea, and I told my wife, hey, what if we were to bring a bunch of strong-willed kids, kids all over the spectrum, into our home, and we'll teach them how to calm their emotions and control themselves and social skills and impulse control, and we'll change plans on them at the last minute and teach them how to deal with frustration because that's all life is, right? Like if you're going to be a Padres fan or a Chargers fan, you've got to get accustomed to disappointment. So, is that not true? I'm sorry. So, over the course of a decade, we had about 1,500 kids come through our home. We had 8, 10, 15 kids at a time in our home. So rather than being a therapist's office where we're just talking to the child and they give us the answers we want, we put them in real-life situations so we could teach them, yeah, I know she's being irritating. Welcome to life. People are irritating. You're going to marry someone irritating. You're going to have irritating children. You're going to have an irritating boss, irritating traffic, irritating politicians. If all you're ever going to do in life is react to irritating people, you're going to be miserable. So why don't I teach you how to stop reacting to other people because when you react to them, they actually have power over you. So 
I hope what you find tonight is this is very, very practical. So let's start with us. I want to uh, hit two things for us as parents. Number one, um, body posture and tone of voice. A lot of this is going to be very abbreviated because we have a lot to get to tonight. But I encourage you, body posture. I'm gonna, uh, this will sound dumb, stupid, funny, whatever. One night this week, when your kids are squabbling with each other or squabbling with you, walk into the living room and lie down right in the middle of the living room floor. And I guarantee you what's going to happen is your kids are going to look at you like, what are you doing? Because what do we usually do? My two daughters over here are arguing, and I usually walk in, you know what? I buy you all these toys and video games, and you can't even play well together for 20, 12 minutes, blah, 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 blah. And they start squabbling back and forth, and now I come in. You two need to get along because one day you're going to be best friends, and we give all these lectures, and all it does is make kids more upset, and I get more upset. True? And I just added all of my drama to this situation. But if I walk in or try sitting down sometime, I discipline 1,500 kids in my home like this. Why? Because watch what I'm demonstrating. I'm in complete control of myself. My yes is my yes. My no is my no. I'm not going to ask you 14 times. I'm not going to threaten you. I'm not going to yell. I'm in complete control of myself. Does that make sense? It does something. It's almost impossible to yell at someone when you're sitting like this. You know what you need? It feels stupid. Now this, I want to be a jerk because that's my natural state. I'm a sarcastic jerk and I want to make a joke about your sports teams just to irritate you. If you see a, t- uh, a mom and a teenage daughter and the mom is standing like this, anything good about to happen? The mom's probably not going to say, you know what, honey? I'm really proud of you. It does, so I'll just leave it at that. Watch your body posture. I know you're like, oh, that's stupid. It's the one thing in the moment that you can control, and it changes things. If you have little kids and you come home from work, and typically if you come home from work and there's Legos all over the floor and you start getting upset, it starts to create a bad, this really negative cycle. But if you were to come home and take a knee like a good quarterback does, you will draw your kids to you. And now I can say, guys, here's the deal. We've got a busy night because I've way overscheduled us. So here's what's going to happen. Son... By the way, take back control of your family life. Don't give it to your neighbors and don't give it to the school system. You get to choose how busy you are. True? You don't have a lot of control of a a lot of things. But if you have strong-willed children, you better create big blocks of time for to happen. Right? Like every afternoon, it'll be a big block. What are we doing? I don't know, but someone's going to melt down. Someone's going to pour chocolate milk in the living room floor. You guys are going to fight. So you know what? I'm going to be ready, and I'm going to have some time for it because I want to teach you guys how to handle conflict while you're young rather than just putting Band-Aids on everything. Does that make sense? So when I come in the room say, guys, we got a busy night. Here's the deal. Son, you and I, we're going to go get started on dinner. Mom, daughter, you guys take care of that. About 17 minutes, we'll meet back here, we'll take off. They're more likely to follow me when I'm talking like that than, guys, you know what, why can't you ever listen? We've got, how many of you in the morning, here's a good one, morning routine, when you come in, guys, come on, get up, school, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. What happens? They usually dive back under the covers and they move more slowly, right? How many of you, when you try to, Sunday morning going to church, worst morning of the whole week, How many of you dropped the F-bomb on your children on the way to church, right? Thank you for your honesty. So, guys, we need to go in because we're going to worship Jesus, right? Like, really? Is that the fruit of the Spirit, Dad? Right? It's because there's so much tension in it. And some, a quick story. So we'd have 10 kids at our house. We'd take them to the pool. In the early days, I do what we all do. Guys, you know what? I'm trying to do something nice. You need to get your swimsuit on, put your suntan lotion, get your towel, move. And it created chaos because here's what they knew internally. The adult in the room is not calm. And no matter what we do, we will not please your anxiety. And you will continue to use that tone. And then in traffic, you're probably going to uh, flip someone off in traffic or cut someone off, and you're going to yell at us. So one day, I came into our living room, 
and I put a towel around my neck, and I sat by the front door. And one by one, all the kids stopped playing with their Legos, looked and thought, oh, we're going to the pool. They knew what to do. How many of you have recognized when you tell your kids repeatedly, sometimes they do the opposite? And when you give them some space, they will do it, but you give them space because it's going to irritate you the way they do it. Because there's a normal right way to put on sunscreen. But they're going to, right? They're going to do it some weird way, and you're going to be like, but you're not doing it the right way. And instead, you have to say, nice job, right? And you're going to have to come to grips with that and wrestle with that as a couple. They're not going to do things the way you want them to do it. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So I'll leave that with that. Let's do uh, tone of voice. Critical. I want you to learn to adopt with a strong-willed child, even matter-of-fact tone. Basically, talk to them like they're an adult. How many of you have ever said before, oh, he's five going on 35? Talk to them like that. So here's what we tend to do. Sweetie, baby, mommy needs your help. And here's what your child hears. Sweetie, baby, you scare the crap out of me. So I think I'll use this sing-songy mommy tone and ask you really sweetly because if I ask you sweetly, then I think you'll do it. And they don't respect it. It sounds condescending and it sounds weak. I am not a fan of parents when asking kids to do things, referring to yourself as mommy or daddy. It sounds weak to them. I know to you it sounds like I'm being sweet, but to the strong-willed child, they don't respect it. Does that make sense? I'm not saying never talk like that, but I wouldn't with a strong-willed child. You know, this tone also, it, it sounds like I'm trying to convince them because sometimes we get in this, right, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to convince you you're not going to convince these kids. So does that make sense? I also don't like the snotty tone, right? God, you know what? I'm, I try to do nice things for you, but if you're not going, right? If you use a snotty tone with me, what am I going to tell you? I'm going to go tell you to yourself. <laughs> True? Is that not your guttural instinct? It's the same when you're five and, or 15 when someone's standing over and talking in a condescending tone like you're not capable. See, I like this phrase, by the way. I believe you're capable of handling that. I believe you're capable of handling this disappointment because you didn't get to do the play date, so you're going to be upset right now. And if I were you, I'd be upset too. But I believe after you're upset for a little bit, you'll pull it together and we'll come up with a different plan. See, that's a lot better than, well, you know what? You know, Johnny couldn't do it, and, and, you know, but we'll do it next week. I don't want to do it next week, right? That's what's inside. So I acknowledge, of course you're upset. You should be upset right now. But I believe that you'll pull it together because you're capable of that. Does that make sense? See, I'm, I'm, I'm in, uh, infusing them, imbuing them with confidence of like, yeah, of course you're upset. By the way, I love that phrase, of course. Of course you're disappointed. Don't minimize it, because that's what husbands do to their wives. Oh, honey, there's no need to be upset. You know what that really is? I have no idea how to handle another person's emotions. So please, whatever you do, don't exhibit some emotions, because I'm clueless. I can go to work and handle anything. But when I come home and my wife's having a bad day, I'm going to talk you out of it. It's not that bad. We live in San Diego. The weather's so good. You just need to be grateful right? Oh, thank you. How many of you do that to your kids, though? Honey, you just need to be grateful. I'm going to flip you off. <laughs> Is that not true? I'm not being disrespectful, but that's the first. Why are you trying to, why, why are we so immature that I can't deal with the fact that you're having a bad day? So you're having a bad day, honey, fine. You're allowed to have a bad day. If you're married to me, you're going to have some bad days. <laughs> now, look, if you want to talk about it, I would love to listen, preferably at halftime, but I'm not going to fix it for you. And I see how liberating this is. I don't have to fix your mood. If you're just having a bad day, you can have a bad day, and that's okay. Does that make sense? It's liberating. You want to tell me what's happening? I'm just going to affirm what you're feeling. Don't argue and don't point, make, prove your point. Well, I just feel like, how many of you get, I just feel like, okay, we're talking about feelings, I'm an engineer, 
already I'm feeling overwhelmed. All you have to do is hug your wife and say this. If I were you, I'd probably feel that way too. True. Wives, husbands too. All of us. All we want to do is know, oh, so what you're feeling is it's completely normal. See, that's of course. Of course you're frustrated with school. Don't try to convince them that school's important and they're going to use what they're learning because they're not. <laughs> Isn't that true? So why do you keep lying to them? They're never going to use that stuff. And if they were going to use it, they'd already have an aptitude for it and they'd be interested in it. True? I'm not saying don't do schoolwork. Of course you're frustrated with that school. That writing assignment, of course. How many of your kids with writing assignments? It's brutal. They can talk all day long. Say, Give me three paragraphs. This is stupid. Writing stupid. Of course it's hard because you've got this great brain and you're always thinking of these interesting ideas, but it gets jumbled in your brain and then you've got to put it on the paper. And also you have dysgraphia and maybe you have dyslexia and we don't even know it. <laughs> right? And then you're like, why don't you just try harder? Please stop saying this. If you would just apply yourself. Strike that from your vocabulary unless you want people to come up every day and say, you know, if you just apply yourself, you'd be thinner. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Is that not true? Because what's the assumption? You're not even trying. And most of your kids are trying. Now, I get it. They give up when things are hard. How many of your kids get up when, th when things are good? We're always like, well, they need to push through. Everybody in here gives up when things get hard, except when you have a job and you're getting paid for it. Right? How many of you have had a really hard talk with your spouse in the next last couple months about all the internal resentments that you have toward your spouse that have built up over the years because you didn't talk about what parenting style you were going to use when you had kids because you were in love and it was going to be awesome. And then you found out marriage is really hard. And then you introduce the strong-willed child and dad's like, well, you just coddle that child. If you would just, right? And you know what the wife ought to say? You know who else I coddle? You, because you can't handle it. Before you get home from work, honey, I try to make sure that everything in the house is just so, because I know when you come in, if things aren't just so, you can't handle it. So you know who I coddle around here? You. I married a big baby, so maybe you need to grow up. So I'm kidding. But I'm not kidding. That's, is that not true? For the men in here, is that not true? So stop complaining that your wife, you know why your wife coddles a strong-willed child? Because she's with him 10 times as much as you are. You know why I worked so much when Casey was little? Because he was a pain. Who wants to do dinner, bath time, and bedtime with a little kid? It's not fun. It's horrible. <laughs> True? I don't feel guilty about that. Look at all the guys like, yeah, speak the truth, man. Right? <laughs> so, of course, I'd come home late from work. Why do you coddle him? Oh, uh, because you spend 10 minutes a day with him, but I spend 10 hours. So in order to not murder your child, I occasionally let him just do stuff, right? Preferably before you get home because you can't. How many of you have a child who when they're with one parent, they're awesome. And then when mom or dad comes along, they're not. You know what they're picking up on is the tension between mom and dad. Because when I'm with mom alone, she lets me run along that wall and it's okay. But when dad's there, he gets really uncomfortable and he gets like this. And so I tend to sense my mom trying to say, honey, it's okay, it's okay. I let him do that. Why do you let him do that? And then just, does that make sense? We make jokes of it, but you really have to deal with that stuff. I'll tell you, marriage, this is not a marriage thing, but marriage will cause you to grow up more than anything else because you are coming face to face with your own. Look, I'm 55, I'm older. The older you get, the more you realize you are so flawed and you have no idea why. You don't. For those of you who are young, you're gonna, you'll find out. You'll be like, oh, I pulled it together. <laughs> okay, just wait. <laughs> you'll find out in, in your 50s, you're doing stuff that you've done since your childhood and you didn't even know it. And you have all these, you're all broken, have these flaws. The per, for those of you who are uh, people of faith, the, person of, uh, the purpose of relationships is not happiness. It is transformation. The outgrowth of your relationship with Christ is not happiness all the time. It causes you to grow. You become a different person. That marriage, that irritating person that you're married to is causing you to grow up. True? 
Or are you going to grow apart and get divorced and lose half of everything you own? It's true. Because I get a lot of men. Well, you know, it just be easier if I get my own apartment. Good luck with that. So, work. I would just encourage you, work on this stuff while you're young and while you can. Because if you don't work on it now, it doesn't get better. And some of you are already counting down the days till the kids are off to college. And you're like, I'm out of there. Christian or not, I'm out of there. I can only take so many years of being dismissed by my spouse and not having a partner who's actually there for me. When my wife used to say, like, you're not emotionally available. I was like, I'm here. I'm locked in. She goes, nope, you're not emotionally available. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. Like, we had nachos last night, watched the Packers game. It was pretty good. I was feeling it. It's a nice night. She's like, no, you're like a robot. When I tell you something, you just internalize things. So I was like, well, why wouldn't you do that? You cause too much drama. I just figure out everything in my head. She goes, well, I need you to emote. I'm a guy. Why would I emote? I figure stuff out, make my plan, and then I go. And I had to go to therapy and figure out how do I emote and share my emotions. Because when I was a kid, you didn't share emotions in front of my dad. And then when I started doing it, she was like, you're becoming more of a girl than I am. And I was like, well, you told me you wanted me to emote, and now I'm emoting too much. Fine. Be better if I, right? That's when you want to quit. So anyway, work on it now. It's worth it, and it will cause you, stop blaming your spouse. It is your spouse's issue, but it's our issue too. We, all, we are all broken, and we all need to grow up. Probably be better if we just did two hours on marriage, but nobody would show up. So, is that not true? <laughs> I'll do anything for my kids, but that spouse? I was doing a phone consultation the other night with a uh, family, and I was like, so what I hear in your voice is, you're patient with your strong-willed daughter, but when you look at your wife, you're like, she's 40, she should know better. And he goes, exactly. That's what happened. True? How many of you feel that sometimes? I'm okay with the child being, but you're like, you, dude, you ought to know better. Successful at your work, why you keep doing the same all the time? So... Be patient with each other and work through it. So, so anyway, tone of voice, we tend to start with a sweetie thing. Well, then we tend to go, you know, how many times do I have to tell you the yelling and screaming? That tends not to work with a strong-willed child because they're fight-or-flight kids. You cannot intimidate a strong-willed child. They are up for the fight. They like it. When they hear you getting upset, all they know is, if I just push dad's buttons a little bit more, he's going to lose it. And when dad loses it, I'm in complete control. He's got owned by a seven-year-old. True? So right in between, sweetie baby, screaming and yelling, it's me in control of myself. And I'll just, I'll model it all night tonight of even matter of fact tone by the way it doesn't mean you have to feel that inside inside you're feeling i want to strangle you <laughs> i would like to put you in a wood chipper right now <laughs> but as long as you have this tone of voice they don't know you can ask forgiveness later for the murderous thoughts in your heart but don't let it out because it sabotages the moment does that make sense and i'll go through an example so i'm just going to leave this at that because i went seven minutes over Work on your own body posture, your tone of voice, your anxiety. We all have anxiety as parents because here's what we're thinking. That child that you have, whether he's 5 or 15, you're projecting into the future. Right? How, many, how is he ever going to be successful? Who's going to marry this child? Who would possibly hire this child? And I'm going to be a failure as a parent because my child can't sit still in circle time. Look, how many of you have a child who's going into school for the first time this year that's strong-willed? Good, get ready. You're going to get phone calls. Your daughter doesn't follow directions. Yep, got it. Because they're going to follow directions. She's going to start to be labeled because she's got a brain and because when she shows up in school, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that she's going to want to do. And she's not going to sit still in circle time because circle time is stupid. It's dumb. Crisscross applesauce Sorry, teachers, but it's not comfortable for a lot of us. And after the age of five, you never have to sit still in a circle. Nobody at the office tomorrow is going to say, hey, Frank, three o'clock in the conference room, circle time. <laughs> Look, it's not really meant to be funny. It's to point this out. There are a lot of arbitrary standards in schools, society, and churches. Churches are filled with non-biblical stuff, just traditions that aren't even true. 
right? Just bow our heads and pray. Tell me where you see that in Scripture. Jesus was always looking up. So when I pray with people, I look up because it makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> Why aren't we bowing our head and pray? Because it's boring when you bow your head and pray. You lose the audience. That's when I sneak out of church. How many of you do that, sit in the back? Let's bow our heads and pray. I'm out of there. I'm not going to fight with all the traffic at this big church. So, but you're going to have arbitrary standards. Well, your daughter can't sit still in circle time, okay? She's five. She's not supposed to be sitting. I'm not talking about allowing kids to run all over the place, but I also don't want to put all these things like, is there something wrong with our daughter? No. Little kids, how many of you have toddlers? A toddler's job description is to explore, make messes, and get into things. They're not supposed to be productive or efficient. And that's your issue, right? Because you, I, I, I've, got, I've got an agenda. Moms, you better let go of that agenda or you're going to squash that child's spirit. I'm not talking about letting them do whatever they want. I'll do tough discipline in a little bit. But their job is to see something and be like, that's really cool. I'm going to go do it. It's not to line up perfectly still when they're five and six and seven. Sitting at the dinner table. How many of your kids struggle at the dinner table? How many dads are this? Yep, Jacob, sit still at the table. We are going to enjoy dinner together as a family. Apparently, you're not. (laughs) I would encourage you. Look, here's the truth. When you and I were kids, those of you who are older, when we got home from school, we were outside playing games like kill the guy with the ball for literally hours at a time. So when we came in for dinner, we were exhausted and hungry. Your kids all afternoon are looking at a screen. So by the time they come into dinner, they're all antsy, right? It's different. Don't be afraid with the strong-willed kids to do things differently. In, two things. In the morning, wake your kids up. By the way, all, you have a lot of little kids in here, so I'll throw this in there. Uh, obstacle course. Many of your kids have sensory issues. They like the sensory pressure. Create an obstacle course in the basement, in the backyard, something they have to crawl through, crawl under, crawl over. Nothing expensive. Don't do what parents do. We got a $4,000 P dollars. They just make stuff up, old stuff, right? Because they have to crawl under and over. Wake them up in the morning. Hey, guess where I hid your breakfast this morning? <laughs> Outside. How many of you have little kids who would love to go forage for their own food? And you can tell them you can eat like a cow or a dog. In fact, I'll put your oatmeal in the dog's dish and I won't even clean it out. And many of your kids, right, in, in, rough, in uh, this rough area are going to have street cred at school. Like, hey, guess where I ate my breakfast? Out of the dog's dish. Mom didn't even clean it out. I'm not being funny with that. Many of your kids would love to eat outside in the morning. Here's the bonus. They want to be by themselves sometimes. And they want to do things in weird ways. So let them. So who cares if they're outside eating? Guess who the bonus is for you and your other siblings? Because you're inside, and that weird, strong-willed child is outside. Everybody's happy. And you're going to be like, I know, but we should always have meals together. Why? You can have other time together. And we did that. You're old. When we were kids, we did that, but we were exhausted. But dinner time, feed them early. All they eat is chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. True? So feed them early. And then have bonding time when they don't have to sit perfectly still. Dads, you can bond with your kids after dinner and roll on the floor and pin them down, do all kinds of sensory stuff. And if it, Does that make sense? It's going, family life is going to look different. It's going to look a lot different when you have a strong-willed child. You're just going to get judged by people. Right, especially the old people because they thought they did it the right way, right? But they just drank half the time, so they didn't even know their kids. True, you guys didn't even know the names of your kids. We had six of them, and sometimes they were there or not. You guys are so intimately involved with your kids, and that's part of the problem is you know everything that's wrong with your child, and so you spend 85% of your energy trying to fix what's wrong instead of 85% of your energy. And please write that down, accentuating what they're good at. None of you in here, look, none of you in here, like you know what. I'm not really good at doing X. I think I'll go apply for a job that requires me to do what I'm not good at. But we do that with our kids all the time, trying to fix everything that's wrong. Some things don't need to be fixed. She's not good at that. So guess what? You're not going to do that in life. 
play to their positives with that. You, sure, you have to shore up some of the weaknesses, but don't fix everything. Some things you're just not good at. That's going to be a hard thing for you to wrestle with. I'll try to get that later when we get to motivating kids. But I encourage you to work on your own anxiety and not project things out into the future. If you have a teenage boy, how many of you have a, a middle school age boy? Good. You know what he's going to be doing? If this was during the school year, and I asked that question, like, what is he doing at home? He's not doing his homework. Sitting in the same hoodie sweatshirt he's worn for about 18 straight days playing video games. Because that's what they do. Right? And what happens is we get all anxious because we want them to do so well. And if you would just apply yourself, you could do so much better. And I just want you to... And, and all of this anxiety dumps all over them. And they resist it and shut down. So I want to start doing these things differently. I'm going to stop right there. Let's talk about... Um, let me do this idea of ownership. Sorry for jumping around. I'm trying to fit as much as I can. Ownership. So please write that word down. I do not give the strong-willed child control of my home or classroom. What we give them is an idea of a uh, sense of ownership. When you and I were kids, we had a lot of ownership of our lives. We'd come home from school, older guys in here, we get home from school at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we were outside running around for hours. In the summertime, our parents didn't even see us. True? We were making dozens of decisions a day, and there were no adults around. You and I got in a little fight, and you bloodied my lip, and we made up, and we figured it out. Nowadays, the parent is over their child from the time they get up till the time they go to bed in the morning. There is an adult telling your child what to do and how to do it. We figured out how to play sports back in the backyard playing by ourselves. You're signing your kids up for soccer for some reason at four when they're age four so they can run in a little circle and basically kick each other, not the ball. And they're not learning. You're just wasting your money. And you're getting all upset because they're not participating because they're four. So chill a little bit. Stop wasting all your money on travel sports because you think they're going to be the next Olympian, which they're not. If they were that good, the, team, the uh, travel team would pay you to have the child on your team. Anyway, I'm just kidding. But Casey played travel ice hockey. It was horrible. It was like $6,000 a year down the drain, and he didn't even get to play. And when he did, he just hit kids because he liked being in the penalty box because that's what he was used to in life. So... Where was I? So the ownership. I want to give kids ownership because we micromanage everything our kids do. So ownership is this. Think of this. I make a big box for my kids to live in. And I say, guys, here's the deal. This is the box that you get to live in. There are very clear rules, very clear boundaries, very clear expectations. Right? Very clear. This is not permissive parenting. Let your kids do whatever they want. Not at all. The difference is I create a big box. And I say within this box, within my big boundaries, as long as you accomplish what I want you to accomplish, I don't care how you get it done. Does that make sense? Because your way is the right way. If your child would just do what you told them to do, it would be quicker and easier. But how many of your kids intentionally choose the harder path? They will choose it. And you will say, well, if you do that, you're going to get this consequence. And they're like, is that the only consequence I'm getting? How many of your kids look at it and they're like, worth it to me? Because they want some owners. Ownership is a beautiful thing. When you can start to embrace this with a strong child and give them some ownership, here's what you lose. Your control over how it gets done. Does that make sense? I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Homework time. Homework's getting done. I just don't care how you do it. We're going to do it in weird ways. If you want to do your homework sitting under, uh, let me do this really quickly. It'll relate to it. Observe your kids. You, a lot of you have younger kids. Observe your kids. They will tell you everything they need by what they do. So we have these kids who will come to our house, and they take the cushions off the sofa and lie down on the hard part of the sofa. And if you have kids who do that, or you have kids, some of your kids lie upside down all the time. So first thought is always, Weird little, mm, why is he doing that? Why is he weird little, freak, mm, mm. and then I started thinking, so what does that tell me? And I got three things from it. One is that they like the sensory pressure. So how can we use that? 
sleep time, when they're sleeping, put them in a sleeping bag. Many of your kids struggle with sleeping, but you put them in a sleeping bag, shove them in a closet, don't tell anyone you're doing that. They often sleep really well because they like feeling all wrapped up in that little cocoon and on the floor. Is it weird? I don't know. That's how people slept for thousands of years before we got beds, right? So don't worry. So we started doing that a little bit. Homework time. Many of your kids, how many of you have kids who like to be underneath things, right? Like they'll, Okay, so they're telling you that feels comfortable. I like it. So in school, ask the teacher, when my child's taking a test or doing an assignment, would it be okay if my child sits underneath the desk while completing the assignment? They're going to be like, well, that's a little weird. I don't care. And you're going to be like, I know, but they're going to look weird. Your kids are already weird. They don't care. They like doing things in a different way. Do they not? They're not joiners. Have you ever noticed they get, don't get along with kids their own age? Right? They tend to get along with older kids or adults or little kids and animals. But they don't get along with peers because they're smarter than their peers, but also socially a little bit more immature than their peers. Right? So there's this, there's this asynchronous development thing going on, and it's hard for them. Go run along, make some friends with people that you naturally don't get along with. How many of you work at a company where there's only people who are 37 years old? It's abnormal. All of my friends are older than me. I don't want to hang out with people that are younger. You're idiots. I want to hang out. True, my best friend is 74. Why? Because I learn from him. And he calms me. He's like, it doesn't matter, Kirk. It's all good. And so don't, anyway, so I don't care how you get your schoolwork. So we got that out of it, doing uh, schoolwork in a different way of underneath the desk. So at home, let them do their homework sitting under the kitchen table rather than standing over them while they're sitting at the kitchen table saying, you know what, if you would just apply yourself, you would be done in, in, in 14 minutes instead of it taking three hours. I don't care. I don't care. Make a bl- take a blanket, put it over the kitchen table. You now have a fork. Forts are cool. They can sit underneath the table and eat the mac and cheese that fell off the table from the previous night because that's good for their immune system. And then they can, well, they can't see. So you give them a flashlight or matches. Doesn't matter to me. That's stimulating for the brain and interesting. And then the third thing that we got was meltdowns. So write down this phrase if you don't mind. Motion changes emotion. And we'll do a little bit more of this later. Motion changes emotion. So we had code words. When kids get upset, do not talk a lot to them. How many of you have noticed the more you talk, the more upset they get? Okay. Then why do you keep doing it? I'm kidding. There's no blame. Look, I don't do any uh, guilt, judgment, blame, and all. We all do the same stuff. But we keep doing the same thing thinking, you know what, I've tried it for 14 years, maybe one more year, right? That's a guy thing of like, well, eventually they'll get it. No, they're not. All you're going to do is lose your relationship with this child and then grow up bitter because your dad never accepted them, which is the story of Cain and Abel, right? Cain didn't get the father's acceptance and murdered his brother. So guys, it's really, really important for you to learn to accept your kids on a deep level, even if you don't like them because you won't always like them and you have to affirm them way more than you correct them. Otherwise, Nothing I was, ever did was good enough for my father. And that will, try, try, that will, some of you labor under that your entire life. I do. That's my dad. My dad never told me he was proud of me. And so I want you to do that. By the way, one more thing for guys. In the dad handbook, it says, if your kids don't look you in the eyes, they're disrespecting you. That's not true. Most of the time, your strong willed kids don't look you in the eyes. One, because they tend to be sensory And looking in the eyes is pretty intense. And the only time we tend to look our kids in the eyes is when? When we're upset. Hey, look at me. Because you never come home and say, hey, look at me. Look at me. You just made a good choice. I'm proud of you. (laughs) Nobody says that. But I want you to start giving your intensity. Please write down the word intensity. I'm sorry. We could do 10 minutes on each topic. Give intensity to when they're doing things well. Because here's when we give it. You know what? How many times do I have to tell you? And the intensity sparks in their brains. It's what they want. They're intense kids. And so I tend to go with, that was a good choice, my friend. Short and sweet with the praise, by the way. Don't go on and on. Oh, honey, you made such a good choice. Then it sounds condescending. 
we never thought you'd actually make a good choice, and you just did. So we're going to photograph it, right? Even matter of fact, hey, I like how you handled that with your sister. Shows me you're growing up. And then I'm out of there. Space. Don't stand over them. You know, I really just want to tell you, da, 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 ugh. right? Christian moms, you do that. I just want to, and it's like, ugh, cringe. Sorry, but it just is. It makes me cringe, and it makes your kids cringe. Just let them know. That's a good choice. Dads, you don't even have to talk much to your kids. Just come home, fist bump. And kids are going to be like, Dad just grunted at me, but he seemed to be happy with me. And that's enough. But let, but let go of that. Uh, dads, it's the di- well, they're disrespecting me. I get that. Sometimes they are. But you know what my response to you is? You're 35. You're 40. Grow up. I know, but my seven-year-old was disrespect. He's seven. What do you think you did when you were a kid? If you could have done that when you were a kid without getting the belt, you would have done it. And you did it in different ways. I'm not excusing it. We're going to handle disrespect afterwards. But we take, stop taking everything personally. Moms, I know, but I try so hard. <laughs> You're trying too hard. That's your issue. Kids are never going to say, hey, mom, listen, My brother and I determined you do way too much around here. (laughs) They're going to use you, and you're allowing yourself. Is that not true? Who do you think church people ask to be on the church committee? People pleasers. Oh, she always says yes. And then you say yes, and you're like, crap, I don't even like those people, right? (laughs) How many of you do that? That's your pattern to break, and so for you, saying no to people, and even saying no to your kids, no, I'm not making that special thing for you because I believe you're capable. You can handle it. And then you're going to be like, am I being a bad mother? Like, I didn't feed them. We're in America. They're not going to die, okay? But you're going to have to actively, here's the term, when we step back as parents, it gives our kids space to step up and be responsible for themselves. As long as I'm on them all the time and micromanaging and making sure everything's okay, they'll never grow up. When I step back, I give you some space. So so let me finish that one thing, and then we'll complete this thought. One other thing, we'll take a quick break. So I noticed in the home, the kids who were doing that sofa thing, we had a code word. And when they got really upset, I'd say, hey, sofa, one word. I gave them a job to do when they got upset. The job was not to calm down. The job was, hey, go throw the cushions off the sofa for me. So they would go in, throw the cushions off the sofa, lie down on the hard part of the sofa. I would walk in, put the cushions on top of the sofa, and lie down or sit on top of them. Instantly calming. Why? One, it's weird. Two, I'm not looking them in the eyes. I'm giving them sensory pressure sitting on top of them. There's no eye contact. And they felt comfortable like that. And then I'd talk to them and say, so a few minutes ago, you were upset about something. What's what's going on? How are we going to problem solve with that? Does that make sense? It's weird, but weird things work with these kids, so observe them. So look, I don't care how you do your homework. You want to do your homework standing at the kitchen counter, listening to music that I hate. You're going to hate your kids' music because they... Parents hated yours, which they should have, because many of you had 80s stuff. It really wasn't that good. So, classic rock, though. Pretty good. There we go. So, and our parents thought we were going to hell, right? (laughs) Now, watching TikTok videos, I would would do anything to destroy TikTok. That is the most inane stuff, so sorry you guys have to go through that. I would rather have them worship the devil with Ozzy Osbourne (laughs) then watch TikTok videos. At least you're going to hell. There, you're literally doing nothing, okay? You know what I'm saying. Isn't this funny? No, it's stupid. At least do something mischievous, right? Is that not true with the kids? Just be mischievous. At least you have to think about how how the neighbors don't catch you. Is that not true? When we were kids, we were mischievous. There's a lot of problem solving. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet here, and the slowest kid's going to get caught, and then we're going to get away. And then we're going to meet behind the barn and look at those magazines. We have no idea what's on there, but we're going to do Is that not true? That's what we're doing. 
Our kids, so if you want to get your kids off screens, go out and do something mischievous with them. Not evil, but mischievous. Go soap some neighbor's cars that you don't like. It's fun. <laughs> it's antithetical to everything you're teaching them about their faith. But anyway, I'm kidding. Don't do that. But it is kind of fun. So <laughs> ownership. Let me give you this example. So we're in um, Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, training uh, drill sergeants and their families, which is trying to get drill sergeants who all day long scream at their recruits to come home and be calm with their, parents, their kids. So it was awesome. So his mom came out to a workshop, and um, she said, um, uh, and, and she came out that night, and the next morning she came out and she told me the story. She said, so here's what happened this morning. When I got up, my daughter was all out of sorts. She was like, I don't know what I want to wear to school. I don't know what I'm going to eat. I don't know where my homework is. And mom's first instinct is what? Jump in and solve it, because moms can solve anything. And instead, mom stepped back, looked at her daughter, and said, I believe you're capable of handling this. Mom walked away and started to drink. So, I'm kidding, she did. But you're gonna feel like it. She's like, oh. Now the daughter starts stomping upstairs, and that's grating on you, because you need to be grateful, and you're not gonna stomp, and you're not gonna, and then she's up slamming her dresser drawers, and you wanna go up and say, you know what? You don't have to respect me, but you're gonna respect my furniture, right? All those things. So, she gave her daughter some space. I would write down the word space. You give your kids some space. Quick aside, you picture a mom and daughter out at a horse barn or a horse, horse farm. They're in the horse barn. Daughter's trying to get her riding boots on. But like many of your kids, this daughter is very particular. And on this particular day, the boots aren't feeling right. And so she's throwing them down and getting upset and calling them stupid. And you're home, you don't use the word stupid. And she knows that. That's why she uses the word stupid because it's your trigger. And so mom responds with, young lady, if you do not pull yourself together and stop using that kind of language, you will never ride a horse again. And what does the daughter do? Okay, mommy, no, I don't care. Horses are stupid, and you're a horse face. How many of your kids are going right there? So instead, what if mom were to pull her phone out and say, hey, honey, I'm getting a call. I'm going to step outside. And if mom were to step outside that horse barn, and spend five or six minutes and give her daughter some space to work through it without someone standing over her telling about her attitude. How many of your kids pull it together when you're not standing? Does that make sense? The space thing, it's all of this is hard, but it's really important. So mom gives this daughter six, seven minutes. Daughter comes down the stairs, smile on her face as if nothing happened because that's what your kids do. And you're like, hey, we need to talk about the fact that you just dropped the F-bomb on your grandparents and your dad. Uh, no, we don't. I don't remember saying that. Wait, you're just going to come down like nothing had happened? Look, I, I would write the word down, uh, uh, shame down. Most of your strong-willed kids have a lot of shame. It happens very quickly in life with that repeated always in trouble. Scripturally, what is the first thing that happened? God says, Adam, don't eat from that tree. What happens? Eats from it. Adam, what happened? She made me do it. What did the first human being do? Blamed his wife and then covered himself up. Why? Because he was ashamed. Many of your strong-willed kids have a deep sense of shame. And I will get to that, whether it's in a few minutes or after the break. Please bear with me. I'm going to get to it. Because all we do, it's always negative, negative, negative. You didn't do that right. I'm going to take this away. Why can't you ever do things right? And inside, that's why they lie, by the way. How many of you have kids who lie? The lying isn't the issue. It's not an integrity issue. It's an issue of no matter what I do, it always feels like I'm wrong and I'm in trouble. So they get very, very good, especially Christian kids. Very, very good. Because most of, a lot of us are not, as Christians, we're into, we're moralists. We're into outward behavior, not the heart. And I want you to get to the heart of it, that the lying is just covering up the shame inside. Does that make sense? I promise I'm going to get to that. Just bear with me. So, this daughter comes downstairs, says, Mom, I got everything taken care of. And the mom said, 
it was so hard not to jump in. But when I step back and I give my daughter a little bit of space, let me do this quick one, uh, ownership. My two daughters over here. You're going to be the mean one who says something mean to your sister. Typical response is I would come and say, honey, you need to apologize to your sister right now. And whenever you say right now, that elicits what? No. If you don't apologize to your sister right now, I'm going to take away everything you own. Fine. Sorry, stupid sister. How many of you get that? And half of you are like, pretty close to an apology. I think I'll take it. (laughs) You're going to wrestle with this as parents. You're going to have to grade on a curve with a strong-willed child. Otherwise, they're always in trouble, and they will never do it fully well. And you and your spouse are going to have to wrestle with that because you've got a compliant child who does everything well. And this other child, you're going to be like, "Mm." there were times with Casey, look, if you watch how he walks, he marches. My son wakes up to German or Russian marching music. He's a freak of a human being, but he's purposeful. And from the early age, he didn't have a problem coming in and saying, Dad, here's what we're doing. I was like, I'm your boss and your dad. And there were times where I looked at him and said, that was almost respectful. I'm going to give it to you. Anybody know what I mean? And you're going to have to weigh that yourself because these kids, they're very direct at times. And if I'm going to go by the letter of the law, you're just going to be in trouble all the time. But I'm going to take into account there's some other things going on. That is who my son is. Even coming here, we have fighting over what time we're going to leave because we're staying down in La Jolla because I use points in a free hotel. It's really beautiful there. And it's a little bit of a drive, and he wanted to get here early, and I usually do. We both have anxiety, so we want to get here early. But I wanted to be on the beach a little bit longer. So he's like, Dad, we're leaving at this time. I was like, I'm the dad here. Well, guess what time we left? We left what time he wanted to leave. Was that me giving in? No, it was just that he wanted to be early. So instead of, you're controlling, why do you have to get your way? I'm like, I appreciate you being conscientious. So we stopped at that prohibition bar thing because that sounded like fun. And I got hammered. So I'm kidding, I did not. I haven't been hammered in years. I was just kidding. It just sounded like a fun thing to do before a church event. But they were very nice. I got the little street tacos. It was good. So, because we were there like an hour and a half early because my son wanted to leave. Instead of being at a beach, we were in a stupid suburb. Anyway, (laughs) kidding. So, seriously, where would you rather be? So, um, but that's what you have to do at times with those kids. So my two daughters, so watch, this is kind of cool. What if I were to come in and say, hey, honey, I know that when you're ready, you know the right thing to do. And then I walk away. Key phrase is there. I know that when you're ready. Now, it's a magical phrase for the strong-willed child. Never use it like this. Hey, buddy, when you're ready, get your shoes on. We need to go. They're never going to get ready. But in an emotional power struggle, here's the difference. If I say, we're doing this right now, it's always no. True? When you're ready, I don't know if this makes sense. How many of you are compliant people by nature? Okay, it's going to be hard. Because when someone tells you to do something, you just do it. I'm the opposite. If you tell me to do it, I'm going to do the opposite, where I'm just going to wait. When I say, when you're ready, it's like it releases them to do what's right, but within their own timing. And I promise after the break, I'll do tough, tough discipline. So I walk away. Now what's going to happen? Is she going to apologize to her sister right away? No! You're going to be laying in bed at night talking to your spouse thinking, are we raising a sociopath? It's not that hard just to say you're sorry. But when you wake up after no sleep, right, no sleep, and you get up, the next morning she does something thoughtful for her sister as an act of contrition. And your appropriate response is, nice job, honey. Shows me you're going up. And then you walk away and you're like, but she still didn't say I'm sorry. Is she going to use the words, I'm sorry? Nope. Why? Because you want it too badly. Because you're rigid. And you'd rather have, I'm sorry, than her heart change. True? And I have to, with that child, I'm like, she just showed contrition, but she didn't look at her sister and say, I'm so sorry. Now, the other sister could be, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry all the time. And that's an awful place to be. True? Those of you who live with that, I know what you, I can tell who you are because afterwards you're going to come up and say, oh, I, I don't mean to bother you. I asked you to come up front and ask me a question. I know, but I'm taking your time. 
And it's a worthiness issue because you don't think you're worthy of having someone spend time helping you. I'm telling you, these things run deep. You know what I just noticed recently? We're in a hotel. We spend a lot of time in hotels when we travel. And I'm like a ghost in the middle of the night because I'm getting older, so you got to pee a little bit more. So I do. And Casey, my wife, are always like, we don't even hear you. You know what I realized it was? When I was a little boy, we lived in an old home with creaky floors. If we got up in the middle of the night, went to the bathroom, and it woke my dad up. My dad was career military and had a very deep, uh, uh, scary voice. Who's up? And I still remember, it's not funny, it's scary, right? It, it, it is funny, but it's, I, I didn't mean to knock you. You just laughed at my pain. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, look, this alone, me using humor is what? It's a way to deal with all the stuff from my dad. And I realized as a 55-year-old man, I tiptoe in hotel rooms because I don't want my dad yelling at me. It's there. Now, I'm not starting to stomp to break the pattern because that would be kind of inconsiderate unless the people, girls that were smoking weed in the hotel room next to us last night in the nice hotel, I wanted to wake up early because I'm old and I'm up 5.30 hitting the gym. I wanted to wake them up, but because I'm a Christian, I can't do that stuff. So anyway, how many of you do that? You weigh it. Last night I was weighing it. I was like, I'm going to be up at 5.30. They're loud. They're keeping me from sleeping. And I don't like the smell of weed. It's too sweet for me. It was coming into our room because we're in California and whatever, or Denver. And I was like, I just want to get back at them in the morning because they're up late at night. And I just want to slam my door a little bit loud. How many of you do that? Or is that just me? Now, I didn't because I try to be like Jesus, Uh, just not my thoughts. So in my actions. I'm horrible in my thoughts. I murder people all day long and then ask forgiveness for it. But how many of you do that as well? I'm with you. But you don't do it in reality, or at least you don't get caught because you're here. So, and I've come to terms with that if I have those thoughts all the time, but then I deal with it. And so we model that. So anyway, um, because who knows what Jesus was thinking at times. Anyway, that's for a different subject idiot disciples. How are we ever going to spread this religion with these guys? Anyway, so (laughs) tools. Let me talk quickly about, is everybody okay? We good? If you need to take a break, just take a break. I'm going to do a couple more examples. You're grown adults. If you need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, but I want to try to fit in as much as I can. Tools. Let's talk about tools and then we may take a break. I don't know. So um, tools. We talked about there's one of two ways to respond to kids' behavior. It is either to react to them, stop doing it or else here's a consequence, or what if I proactively know you struggle in that area and I begin to give you tools to succeed. So let me give you some examples of tools. So in school, here's a really quick one. How many of your kids struggle with focus and attention? Okay, so you're just saying you need to focus better How? So this is a sensory strip. It's double-sided tape. On this side are some little textury strips from an arts and crafts store. It costs 12 cents to make. Science and research say when kids play with textured objects, it improves concentration. This actually wakes the brain up. Fidgeting, healthy fidgeting is good for kids. It's the body's natural response, which many of you in here are doing it by bouncing your feet. Some of you taking notes. Some of you who are chewing on something or eating. You're keeping your brain awake. It's good for it. You haven't stopped moving your foot the entire time. That's good. If I say, hey, put your foot down, put your foot, put, put your foot down. You won't pay. Look, she wouldn't even do it. (laughs) rebellious. That's how I can tell the Christian parents who email us, my child's rebellious. I was like, okay, so you're, uh, uh, you're uh, a law-based Christian, right? Because you see everything is rebellion when you just have a seven-year-old that wants to do stuff. Did that offend anybody? Because it wasn't meant to. But it's awful and true, right? You got to watch that. I was raised in a very law-based thing. I'd encourage you to watch this. Your view of God will determine often how you discipline your kids. If you think like God God is, like I thought for many years, and I continue to reprogram myself, God is just out there like my dad waiting to get me, well, guess what? You tend to see your kids 
You see yourself as like, well, I, I've got to do that with my kids. I'm on them all the time. And what you'll find with the strong-willed kids is they will just always be in trouble and they will shut down and you'll lose your relationship with them. And these are the kids with the biggest hearts. I encourage you to read Scripture over with fresh eyes and see the kids in Scripture who were initially rebellious were usually the ones with a big heart. The prodigal son story was not about the prodigal son. He came back and his heart was good. Who was it? It was the older brother. I have done everything you have ever asked me to do. He had a bitter, nasty little spirit. Did he not? And he was the good kid. He who is forgiven of much loves much. And that's why you should do mischievous things with your kids so you can feel forgiven. So, no, I just encourage you to read it fresh about the heart. It's heart-based, not just outward behavior-based, which we get into with the church sometimes, very focused on that. How many of you have a child who misbehaves, but if you pass a homeless person or a dog in trouble, will stop and give them everything that they have? And when I work with Christian parents, I'm like, your child's exhibiting the characteristics of Jesus. They just don't sit still. They don't follow directions well. I know, but they need to learn to be obedient. Well, half of most of obedience for Christian parents is I just want you to do what I want you to do because it's more convenient. True? I want you to wrestle with that. Think, well, I want my kids, mm, I wasn't going to go here, but let me just do it. I want my kids to be obedient. Well, is that your goal? Because that's your goal, they're going to mess up all the time because they can never be obedient enough for you. Well, my goal is I want my kids to grow up and love their neighbors as they love themselves. My son will do that all day. You get them to unload the dishwasher, not going to happen. <laughs> Most of your kids, I'll tell you right now, strong will kids are not going to do their chores. They're not, but they're going to do things for other people. How many of you have kids who are amazing for other people and horrible for you? That's a strong-willed child, and you're going to have to wrestle with it. You know what we eventually said? We're raising this kid to be good out in the real world, and he's awesome for other people. He's just horrible for us. How many of you get that? And so we let, So I would encourage you with chores, make your list bigger. Remember the boundary. Make the rectangle bigger. You've got this narrow list of chores. Your kids will do things around the house that are weird. I have kids who change the oil in the car, who love to shovel mulch. How many of you have kids? They're sensory kids. They love to shovel stuff. So instead of unloading the stupid dishwasher, which they're never going to do to your satisfaction anyway because you have control issues and you're a freak, instead, why can't they shovel mulch and do stuff outside where they're happy? And why don't you notice what they're naturally doing and just say, that's good. Not what I asked you to do, but you did a good job with that. Well, what about the other kids? Because they do everything I ask. Well, they have a, uh, what I would call compliance disorder because they're too good, right? Well, just that's what they naturally like doing. Well, how come he gets to do that? I don't know. It's not fair. Well, you want to walk a day in his shoes? You want to go to school and not have many friends and not do sleepovers and get in trouble all the time? You want to talk fairness? How come, you know it's not fair? It's not fair for you, compliant child, that you do your homework in 12 minutes and it takes your brother three hours. You want to walk a day in his shoes? Because I don't think so. So instead of talking about fairness, right, why don't we talk about gratitude, you little snot? So, <laughs> kidding. Don't say these things, just think them. But is that not true? I'm asking you to change how you view human nature and the kids, they're not going to do things. They're not going to do the chores for you that well. But they're going to go down to someone else's house and help them. And you're like, what I want most from you, what is? To love God, two greatest commandments. To love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say to love your parents. True? I'm not talking about being disrespectful. We'll do that. We will get to that. But yeah, you loved your neighbor by doing that. You didn't do X, Y, and Z, but you did the right thing. And I'm okay with that. And compliant child, you're good at that. You like doing that. You don't get anything special. That makes you feel good inside. right? You'll be resentful later in life. But that's good. You're good with that. So I'm asking you to wrestle with a lot of things and see it differently. So this sensory strip. 
Child's desk at school, tape that right underneath the desk. Child can be sitting in class playing with this thing all class period long, all day long. It doesn't make any noise. Nobody can hear it. They can't whack their classmate in the face with it because it's taped down. Does it change the whole school day? No. But a few days, times when I was zoning out or wanted to play with my classmate's face or hair, I had something appropriate to fidget with. I gave them a tool. Let's say, what's your name? John. John's in my class. I come into the class and his leg's moving all the time. What do I know? Probably needs to move a little bit. And I have one of two options. You need to sit still for 45 minutes in my class or else I'm going to write you up and you're going to be on red on the behavior chart and I'm going to take away recess, which is going to hurt me because then you don't get any exercise. And what's going to happen every day? John, 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 sit down. John, John, John. And you know what your kids, how many of your kids the first day of school know whether the teacher likes them or not? Many of your kids are going to come home and say, she doesn't like me. There's something in there that they sense. And then it just, and then eventually what they do is, screw you. And then they'll intentionally get in trouble, intentionally do things to tweak the teacher because they do it to you. You know what they're doing? They're tinkering with your brain because they tinker with Legos. Have your kids take apart things and don't put them back together and they play with things. It's what they're doing. They're tinkering with your brain. If I just do this little thing, dad gets upset. I can see him right now. And they're tinkering with your brain. And instead of, let me do the disrespect thing in a second. So instead, I pull John aside and say, John, I could really use your help. How many of your kids, you know, those are magical words for strong-willed kids. They love helping other adults. Listen, I know you need to move, and I need some help, because when I teach in class, my mouth gets kind of dry. So you and I are going to have a secret signal. When I'm teaching in class and I do this or this, here's what I want you to do. You get up out of your seat, you come up to my desk, grab my water bottle. You're going to take it to the back of the room, refill it, bring it up, and sit it down. You don't get to talk to anybody. You're not going to distract anybody. You're going to be Mr. Invisible. You up for that? And most little kids love that. Middle school can't be Mr. Invisible. They'll get beat up for that. So we just change it a little bit based on age. But I'm teaching in class, and instead of giving the negative energy, John, 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 I give him the signal, signal. He comes up, watch what happens. Grabs the water bottle, goes back, refills it, brings it up, sits on the desk, and sits down. It took him 23 seconds, that's all. And I got to end that scene with, hey, good job, thank you. 23 seconds. I gave him something appropriate to do within my boundaries. I gave him a very specific job. I didn't say, hey, little guy with the ADD brain, if you get bored in my class, just run around. That was very, very specific. So be very specific and concrete. So he can hold this. He can feel it. When he's in the back of the room refilling this, it gives him a little break, and he knows that he's going to do it well because he's good at doing stuff like this, just not all that school stuff all the time. And I'm building his confidence because now I just created a success. I would write that phrase down. For those of you with kids with behavior issues, for the next two weeks, the next three weeks, the next four weeks, create successes. Otherwise, you may as well just tell you, you know what, I'm never going to be happy with you. You're going to grow up angry, and we're not going to have a relationship. Because that's kind of what happens, right? I give them tools. And one of the best tools for strong-willed kids is to give them missions and jobs, things they're good at. Get up in the morning, find your breakfast outside. I just created a success. That kid, look, I don't care where you get dressed. If you want to get dressed outside, do it, Right? Look, in the morning, look, every morning, John, every morning in our home, school bus leaves, carpool leaves at 8, 20, uh, 727 a.m. I don't care how you get ready for school. I don't care what you look like, what you smell like. I don't care what's in your stomach. I don't care. If you're smart enough to sleep in until 725 and sleep in the clothes that you wear to bed, that, that, you're, uh, that you're going to wear to school the next day, how many of your kids do that? Sleep in the clothes you're going to wear the next day to school. You can wake up at 7.25, roll out of bed, grab that Pop-Tart that you hid underneath your bed because I knew you hoard food up there. <laughs> you can run out to the car or the school bus. You don't even have to have your, your shoes on. You live in San Diego. The weather's always great. And at the end of the day, if he made that school bus at 7.27, you know what I'm going to tell him? Nice job making the bus. Now, what am I feeling inside? I want him to get up and have blueberries and avocado and good healthy fats, those brains ready to learn. And I want him to look nice and smell nice. I don't care. 
I don't care. Be on the bus at 727. If you're my daughter, I want you to smell so boys don't like you. I don't care. You know what? I promise you what will eventually happen. That will irritate him. The rush will irritate him, and he'll begin getting up earlier himself, and eventually he's going to find out every day in third period my stomach is upset because, I'm, uh, because I didn't eat breakfast. They don't need the lecture. They'll figure it out. First, they're going to uh, steal kids' uh, uh, food, or they're going to barter for it because they're resourceful. And you let them know. It's called being resourceful, my friend. And eventually they'll come down and say, Mom, Dad, every, more, every day in third period, my stomach hurts. No lecture. You know what? I've been telling you for months that you need to eat a healthy breakfast. You. No. They'll be like, yeah, I know. Every morning, we've got an array of food available. You can even fix it yourself. How many of your kids cook? Many of your kids, strong-willed kids, love to cook. Just know they're not going to follow the recipe, and they are not going to clean up. They're not, so just let it go and say, thanks for making dinner. I'll spend the next four hours cleaning up because that's reality. How many of you have found that? I'm asking you to deal with the way that they are, not the way you want it to be. So those are tools that I give him in order to be successful. So tough discipline. Let's just do this. Do you guys mind if I roll with this or do you want like a five-minute break? You guys good with it? Okay, it's 35 minutes. I believe you're capable <laughs> sitting for another 35 minutes. So when your kids are like, I can't sit. I know I was at this parenting thing and it took so long. So let's do a couple tough discipline ones. You can declare martial law in your home. You can be really tough. I just want to be short and sweet. Guys, here's the deal. I'm going to give you 27 minutes to play your video games. 27 minutes. When I walk into the room after 27 minutes, if I even hear a peep that says, hold on, I just need to save it. I need to get to the next level. You will have chosen to lose your video games screens for the next three days. Choice is up to you. Now, I can teach them how to set a little timer or some of you got them an iPhone way too early, and now you regret it. True. How many of you gave in because you were weak and you did that? I'm kidding. I own Apple stock, so get an iPhone. But, <laughs> right, we do that. So I, I'll, for those of you with younger kids, all I would encourage you is wait, 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 and be the weird parent. Be the weird parent. Let your kids hate you. Because as soon as that thing gets in their hands, it's constant. Can I play? Can I play? I Just a few more minutes. Just a few more minutes. No, nope, take it. Take it away. Three days. Can I have it back yet? Can I have it back? Can I have it? Right? So maybe at the end I can do some things on screens. It's really hard what you're dealing with because you're getting bullied by society and everybody else and all the horrible parents who let their teenagers stay up till midnight texting. And you're home, your teenage daughter has to put her phone on the kitchen counter at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever, and she misses out on all the conversations that are going on, which is really hard for a teenager. So if that's an issue, ask me about it, and I'll give you kind of a little solution for that. But so 27 minutes, choice is up to you. I remove myself. I come back into the room after 27 minutes. What am I going to find? My two kids are still going to be on their video games. Why? Because that's their job is to push the limits, argue, and negotiate and see if they can wear you down. So when I come back in, none of this, you know what? I tried to give you some ownership of your video games and you can't even do it, blah, 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 blah. Not a lot of words. Hey, guys, just wanted to remind you, you just chose to lose your video games the next three days. Now, what are your kids going to say? Mom, Dad, it makes us feel safe when you give us rules and follow through. We really appreciate it. Yeah, they're not going to say that. That's dumb. You're stupid. Come on, just a few more minutes. Ah, ah, ah. Watch, the tone of voices, this is just the way I roll in my home. It's nothing personal. Don't take it personally. When I tell you, look, here's the principle. When I tell you something, I take action. I don't talk. You have to take action with a strong-willed child. They want you getting upset. Because as soon as you start to convince them, they're like, oh, now I'm going to get them all wound up. And they draw you into an argument, and they'll use such logic that they give you a curfew, right? 
There's no convincing. I'm just letting you know when I tell you something, I do what I say I'm going to do. See, that resigned tone is really, really good. Yeah, I, I, I get it. You're upset. You know what? They're not upset at you. Who were they upset at? Themselves. Because you were very clear. But see, this low-key tone is really cool. There were times where Casey used a disrespectful tone with me, and I'd look at him and say, I think you just flipped me off in your brain. I see it in your eyes. So, two choices. You may continue to talk to me like that if you want. Because they can if they want. You may. But here's what I know. Every time you use that tone with me, it usually tells me you're anxious, you're frustrated, or you're hungry. Those are Casey's three triggers to this day. It's anxiety. What was getting here about? Anxiety because there's a lot of traffic and we had to get here on time. What causes what happens when you have anxiety? You get short with people. Frustration. Hunger causes people. So, Casey, you may continue to use that tone with me, but it never ends well for you. You always end up losing your stuff. Can you kind of hear that in the tone? Right? It's not like, how dare you talk to me like that? And all I tell you is, you're the grown-up, so we have to act like it. It's not about me. Well, he called me a name. You're 35. I'll call you a name. Right? Does that make sense? Like, it's a kid coming at me. Look, you can talk to me like that if you want, but it just never ends well for you. So, one of two options. Keep talking to me like that. You'll just lose all your stuff. See, it's an accomplice. There's no threat there. Just that's the, way, that's the way that I roll. But if you want, I'm going to go grab some chips. You could grab some salsa, and I meet you out on the deck. I'll help you with whatever you're struggling with. See, now I'm leading to problem solving. I'm not letting him get away with calling me that. I'm understanding that he's probably upset something's going on rather than, you know what? You're not going to talk to me like that. Watch what happens. To your room for the rest of the night. You know what we're really saying? I can't handle you when you're at your worst. Go away from me. Right? And I understand why we do it. There's no blame or guilt in that. We all do it. I can't deal with it. You go. Instead, something's going on. You're calling me names, you're melting down. Something's going on. I'm a problem solver. So look, you can do that. It's not going to end well. But if you want to go and see there's that phrase, I hope I used it before, motion changes emotion. When people are upset, motion or movement. I'm not going toe-to-toe with my son when he's up. You know what? We need to have a talk about your attitude. What is he going to say? What attitude? That attitude. Now I have attitude. Does it ever, and, and I'll tell you, as, as a man, when Casey was getting taller, I was getting very close to poking him in the chest. And I'll tell you, your kids are bigger than you, and they will get bigger, and you do not want to start to get physical with them. And I was really close, because he would just look at me like this. He'd be like, little mother, sorry. <laughs> How many of you have that thought? <laughs> Thank you for the honest people. No, that's an honest thought of like, you little. But I had to step back and say, something's going on with you, and I'm going to problem solve. So I'm going to get the chips. You get the salsa. Now, over time, that became our thing. That was our code word. We had a plan of action. When things are falling apart, we eat chips and salsa. Why? Because you never see two people eating chips and salsa yelling at each other. (laughs) Is that not true? Throw in a couple margaritas, everybody's happy. But there's something about that if I'm doing, you know what, you know what, how about this one? You know what, keep it up, young man, keep it up. What are they going to do? They're going to keep it up. One more word, young man. You know what Casey told me once? Word. (laughs) Why? Because he's a jerk. And that's what he did because he knew I couldn't handle it. And I would always, you know what? How many of us do this one? You already lost your video games for two weeks. You want to make it three? And the strong will tells it, why don't we just make it a month? You're like, <laughs> how many of you swear sometimes? And you're like, Ugh. and you know what I realized in those moments? And this will sting a little bit. What I was really saying is, I need you to behave 
because if you don't behave and do exactly what I tell you to do, I'm not sure I can behave and you do not want to see me angry. Does that make sense? That's what I was saying. But I came in and there was a moment where he was yelling at my wife instead of coming in, you're not going to talk to your mother like that to your room right now. I would walk away thinking, I just stood up for my wife. And you know what she was thinking? You just ruined the whole night. Because now I've got to spend three hours in the bedroom calming our child down, explaining that your father doesn't hate you. He just has some unresolved issues from childhood, right? <laughs> and then I would come downstairs feeling justified. For the men in here and the moms, you will feel justified. You're justified every day in yelling at your child, sending them to the room, and correcting them all the time. You're justified. But it doesn't mean it's right, and it doesn't mean that it works. Does that make sense? Humility, whether you like it or not, one way or another, you are going to be humbled by the strong-willed child. Because if you're intent on this, you know, my way or the highway, then you may as well just say, I'm going to piss away my relationship with this child. Sorry for language. I hate that word, but it just came out. I like intensity, so forgive me for the language, but I like it. When I talk to God, I talk in intense terms. I sometimes swear when I talk to God. I know some of you are horrified, but I do because it makes it real. I was meditating one day. I was walking, and I was thinking about that scene where all the dudes bring out the woman caught in adultery, all filled with sex stuff on her naked and leave her out there. And it'll make you cry if you think about it. And the God of the universe is standing in front of her, Jesus. And what does he do? He kneels in the dirt so he could avert his eyes from her shame. The moralists in here would be like, little tramp, were you thinking doing that? She didn't need that in the moment. The woman was caught, and he kneels in the dirt. And I remember, this is not a justification. I'm completely comfortable with this. I went home, and I wrote a little thing, and I said, effing God of the universe knelt. And I don't know why, and I know that, I, uh, but it makes it real to me that he knelt. Instead, of, he humbled himself in front of the woman. Called, does that make sense? Because that breaks down the barriers with that. And so when I humble myself and say, hey, I can tell you're frustrated. I'm going to go outside. I've got the football when you're ready, if you want to come outside and play catch with me, I'd love to figure out what's going on. I don't have to do that. I'm the dad. I can say, you're not going to talk to my wife like that. Go. Nothing wrong with that. But you never get to the root of the issue, and you never actually teach. And discipline literally means to teach, it means to disciple. See, in that moment, I'm justified yelling at you. But I humbled myself and said, if you want to come in and build some Legos with me, I'll do that with you because something's going on with you. And my job as your dad is not to walk around and correct you all the time. It's to teach you and to teach you how to deal with frustration so you don't yell at your mother because that caused you to lose all your stuff, and that's not what you want to do. Does that make sense? Forgive me for some of the other stuff in there. But I ha uh, anyway, I trust you to deal with it how you deal with it. Um, no, you're just going to have to deal with stuff. I'm learning as I get older. People irritate me, and, and I'm, I'm teaching Casey this. Find someone who irritates you and learn something from them, even something com completely opposite politically that I don't like. What can I learn from that person? Because they've got a perspective that I need that will round me out. I've spent the last year volunteering in an inner city because we couldn't travel in inner city, uh, inner city school in our, in our uh, community. It's, it's just, it's a completely different culture than I'm used to. And I always had solutions for that culture, but I'd never really known any of them. And I'm like the lone white guy in there, and I'm learning from them. And they're learning from me, and it's a cool experience, but blowing my mind with all the stuff that they do. And now I know more rap music than any of the white kids in my neighborhood. So anyway... <laughs> Hold on just a second. Um, I wish we had like another hour. I would give you a break if we did. So 
So a 13-year-old um, daughter, it doesn't matter the age, let's, say, let's do a disrespect thing, uh, mom and daughter. So uh, you're my daughter, and, uh, and this may be the language. Honey, you may continue to talk to me like that if you want. Honest statement. I don't need you to respect me. I don't. I'm a grown adult. I don't need you to respect me. The reason that I want you to respect me is because it's good for you. Does that make sense? The reason I want that young man out there to respect his father, it's not for me. I don't need his respect. You're a terrible father. Oh, my world's going to crumble. I don't need it. It's good for him. So, look, a couple responses. If you think that you're going to talk to me like that, and then I'm going to turn around, make you special meals, or get up off my comfortable seat, which I know is no moms ever get to sit any. But if I'm going to leave my comfortable house and travel, go out through traffic and take you to an extracurricular that costs way too much and you're not even good at, you've got another thing coming to you. Not going to happen. I'm fine with withholding things and saying, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not doing that for you. When you, there are times when you declare martial law in your home. Hey, Saturday we had planned a fun outing. Nobody did anything they were supposed to. So on Saturday morning, all these things are getting done before we do anything fun. <laughs> that's dumb. That's stupid. Uh, I know. I'm okay with that. Be angry at me if you want. Just to let you know this is how I roll and this is my expectation. Does that make sense? I like the low key thing. I'm, I, even in the, in, in the inner city thing that I'm working with, I found when I go low key and I say, hey, I know why you're using that language. Because you think it's going to make the other kids respect you, but they're laughing at you. What I really see in you is you want to be a leader. I can teach you how to be a leader. So if you want to come grab me later, I'll show you. And that low key thing is really, really powerful because it shows I'm in control of myself and I'm not getting flustered by it. So, honey, here's the thing. You're 13. You're going to want to get your driver's license, go to a lot of sleepovers, do all kinds of fun things as a teenager. But here's what I know. Every time you talk back to me, every time you roll your eyes at me, it tells me you're not mature enough to handle that freedom, and that makes me sad for you. So if you want to continue to talk to me like that and roll your eyes, then you're just not going to get the freedom that you should get. But if you want to problem solve with me and talk to me like an adult, I'm all ears. Does that make sense? Low key, don't react, enter into it. It's really helpful. How many of your kids struggle with anxiety of some kind? Okay, let's do this example. So, uh, John's my son, and I come home one day, and I'm like, hey, John, you want to do Taekwondo this fall? And he's like, sure, Dad, sign me up. Three weeks go by, and I come home, John, got to go, got to go. Come on, we got Taekwondo tonight. Let's roll, let's roll. And what do we usually get? Dad, you know, my stomach's kind of upset. Can we just stay home tonight? I promise I'll go next week. No, no, here's what we're going to do. If we leave right now, we'll stop at McDonald's. We'll get a Happy Meal, and everybody will be happy. Bribery never works. And so when that doesn't work, we do this thing. You know what? I paid $142 for that class. Your little butt's going to be in the car right now because I'm not wasting that kind of money. He's never going to say, Dad, I didn't really want to go, but now that I know how much it costs you, I'm motivated. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So the only thing I have left is I'm going to grab him by the arm. And we're going to fight the whole way to the car because when I was a kid, I didn't get to do extracurriculars. You're gonna, you need to be grateful for this. And I'm going to shove him in the car like to do on the back of those cop shows, right? Like put the hand over the head. Just get in the car. And along the way, your child may do this. No, I'm not going. Taekwondo's stupid. You're stupid. How many of you ever get that? It's a lovely gift, especially in front of the neighbors. Like, oh, we thought they were a Christian family. So... <laughs> Why is that dad cursing at his son in the parking lot? So, in the moment, what I'm looking at, I see a defiant, disrespectful child. In the moment, we tend to react to it. You know what? You will get your butt in the car. You just go to your room. for the And we miss the whole, the whole scene. Most of the time, these kids, they struggle with anxiety. Anxiety is caused by unknowns, things they cannot control. And, it, and we went through that first column. They have very, very busy brains. It's hard. So rewind. Next time, what I want to do is this. I don't react. I step back. I give myself a second and think, okay, this kid's telling me I'm stupid. He hates me. He doesn't want to go. What else is going on? 
Because my job as a parent, I think, is not just to discipline my child. It's to give them tools and to give them wisdom. I write it down, wisdom and tools. And when I step back and I look at this child and think, why is he swearing at me and telling me he's not going to go and that I'm an idiot? Why would he do that? Because he's just going to lose everything he owns. Does that make sense? When they do irrational things like that, it's usually anxiety. So then when I look down and said, John, I think I know what's going on. You're nervous. You should be nervous. Going to new- Look, acknowledge it. Normalize anxiety. Our society is sending, oh, my wife's a therapist, but most of, most of your kids in these situations, they don't need therapy. Let's take them to a therapist, and every week they can talk about their anxiety. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to be riddled with anxiety. They just keep talking about it all the time. right? Instead of normalizing and saying, John, of course you're nervous. You're going to a new place that you've never been, and there's all these different kids there. Of course you're nervous. See, I just, I just normalized it. Is your stomach a little bit upset? Mm-hmm. It should be. When I talk to your mother-in-law, oh, my stomach gets upset a lot. <laughs> when I have a new project do at work, my stomach gets upset. When I have to do something really difficult, my stomach gets upset because that's where anxiety lives. And that's why some of your kids, by the way, struggle with eating, and they'll eat simple carbs all the time. Some of your kids, all they eat is simple carbs. Bagels, uh, peanut butter and jelly, uh, all those uh, mac and cheese. It's easy to process because their stomach's always upset because they don't like school, whatever it is. That's not an eating issue or nutrition issue. It's an anxiety issue, and their body's just craving that because it feels good on their stomach. So, So when I acknowledge that and say, of course you'd be nervous, it's like, so I'm not a defiant kid who's going to get in trouble. No, you're just an anxious kid. Do you know how good that is if next time you're freaking out over something in life and your spouse were to look at you and say, of course you're upset. You should be upset. Okay, so I'm not crazy? Mm, no. <laughs> no. You should be anxious because our kids are going to a new school, because our son's never done well with that. Now he's doing this. Instead of being in denial, of course you're upset. That other lady at church said that about our kids. Of course you're angry at her. Now we're going to work through forgiveness, but of course you are. Does that make sense? That acknowledgement of just like, of course, it takes away all the ick from it. So now I get to the tool, which is this. Whenever your kids go new places, I'd encourage you to do this. If you can go a few minutes ahead of time, a week ahead of time, if you would say, hey, Mr. Taekwondo, this is my son. He's going to be in your class next week. You give him a job to do. He loves helping other people. Not us, but he loves helping other people. (laughs) And when Taekwondo guy says, hey, John, I'm psyched you're in my class. Listen, I need your help. Every week I want you here five minutes early. When you come into my class, you're going to rearrange the mats, set up the cones, get ready for class. You up for that? Most of your kids for other people? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So when I come home next week and say, John, we got to go. We got Taekwondo. What triggers in his brain is not all the unknowns of like, have I ever been there? Is it going to be loud in there? Are the kids going to pick on me? What if I'm not good at it? All those things. What if I'm not good and I want to quit? And Dad's going to call me a quitter. Instead of all the unknowns, what triggers? Mom, Dad, remember that guy said he needed my help and we need to be there five minutes early. So we have to leave like three and a half hours early. So we're not late. (laughs) Honor leaving early, even if it's a waste of time to you. By the way, for some of your kids, the first time they go to that new class, Sunday school, if all they do is sit on the sidelines and eat some crackers and watch, that's a win for them because you got them there. Does that make sense? You're going to be like, just, here's it. Go, just go, just go, just go, just go. Stop pushing them like that. The little ones who are shy, who hide behind your legs, come and say hello. Come say hello to Mrs. Robinson. No, she's stranger danger. They're shy. I was voted shyest boy in my high school class. They're just shy, that's all. By the way, in school, well, your daughter won't participate. That's fine. She doesn't collaborate well. I know she's going to own her own business because God knows nobody's going to hire her. (laughs) Look, the point of that is you've got to work with the child that you've been given, right? Well, everybody needs to collaborate. No, they don't. Why do you think I don't work in the corporate world anymore? I don't like collaborating. My wife loved to collaborate in grad school. Oh, I love to get together. I didn't. In college, I would tell the other kids, look, I'm a good writer. 
I'm not going to worry about your schedules and trying to get ready for you. I'm going to do this project by myself. I will put your name on it. But you're not very bright, and I'm pretty good at writing, and I don't want my grade to depend on you, so I will just do it. You give me pizza money, everybody will be happy. But I'm not going to collaborate with people. Why would you want to work with other people? How many of you are like that? Okay. Everybody needs to learn how to participate in class. Why? It's unnatural. Reading in front of people. Don't get freaked out because your kids are different. Just know it's kind of the way he is. I'm okay with it, right? Just give him jobs to do. He'll do really well. But if you think he's going to follow all your directions, probably not going to happen because he's not doing it at home. Does that make sense? I can be tough, but I'd rather put the time into doing the tools. So wherever your kids go, when they're going back to school, find an assistant principal, teacher, someone who will give your child a job to do if they have anxiety about school. Oh, no, I talked to them. They know that you're really good at X. Could you do that for them? And then their brain, instead of being focused on all the unknowns, is focused on what they're supposed to do. Does that make sense? Let's do, uh, let's do an example on um, uh, getting your kids. What were you going to say? I'm going to do that. Let me do this because we have 10 minutes. You know, it's funny. So during, so during the break, oh, Casey, did you leave me my thing? Um, so during the break, thank you. So during the break, I usually bring the CDs out. And I'm like, you guys need to get the CDs because you're going to leave here. Let me just give you this short pitch. The reason I want people to get our audio CDs is not because I make money. They paid me a lot of money to come to California. It's pretty awesome. And so, but the real reason is, is because you have to listen to stuff again and again and get the insights so that it gets in you because everybody leaves and they're like, I took notes. And I guarantee you in three days, you're going to be freaking out on your kids. And I want you to listen to this stuff. No, I want you to listen. You get it physical, but they all come with downloads. And I'm going to do this really quickly, but I usually do it during the break. So I noticed Casey out there because he's irritated at me because when we do a break, we sell more of these because people have time to buy them. But I didn't want to do the break tonight because I want to do that. So he was standing in the back. It was a subtle form of control. Why? Because my son loves me, and he likes for us to make money. So he's standing back there intimidating me, so move, because I don't like it. So that's exactly what was happening. He was like, when are you going to stop talking and do the pitch for the CDs? Because if we don't sell enough, I'm going to blame him that he didn't handle people's things at the end of the night. And I was like, we had a good crowd, and they had money. We saw their cars outside. We should have sold a little bit more. So it's true. I'm I am a full-blown capitalist. So, no. Look, I'm older. I don't need the money. This is what I tell people. Let me do the thing really quickly. And you get these all as downloads, but we've got physical because it makes it more concrete. Enjoy your strong-willed child. Everything I know about strong-willed children for the last 20 years, I want your kids to even listen to this one because they'll feel understood. It's very foundational because your kids are going to be like, that's me. That's me. And you're like, here's a good question to ask your strong-willed child. Do you ever feel misunderstood or like, I've, or like I've judged your motivations? Ask them that this week sometime and then listen to them because I guarantee we all do and it'll really reach into them. Discipline that works, getting kids to listen the first time, all that stuff. I go through dozens of examples on that one. There's one 30 days to calm, which is for us. It's a process I went through to go from freaked out, always reacting to learning how to control myself. There's one for kids, kids ages two to seven, little kids. ADHD university, kids don't have to have ADHD, but if they struggle with any of these things um, on that chart, we go through that chart in great detail. It's great for homework and school issues. Straight talk for kids is Casey's. My son does school assemblies all across the country. It's our most popular CD because it's my son talking to kids because kids listen to other kids, but they won't listen to stupid parents. And he teaches your kids how to control their emotions and how he learned to go from a reactive kid to being able to control himself. Stop defines disrespect and meltdowns. There's one on motivating kids. There's one just for dads. Here's the thing for the dads one. It's short and sweet. I talk in bullet points. Because that's how we like it. We don't like long voicemail messages. And when we call from the road and say, what would you do today, honey? I don't want to hear, well, I got out of bed. So I'm short and sweet. And I just tell men, I'm like, here's what you do. Men love that. There's one for moms. I'm a little bit nicer on this one. Right? Because it's hard being a mom. Hardest job in the world is being a mom. You know why? Because you never feel like you've done enough. True? 
There's no way to measure it. Men, we go, to, right? Women at the office, it's measurable. With your kids, never know, right? So anyway, so here's the deal with the CDs. They're expensive. If you look on the website, they're typically $97 each. These cost me $1.22 to produce. They went up a little bit because of inflation. Paying for this little plasticky stuff, I'm trying to get them down to $1.18, but I can't. So we sell them, we make them expensive for two reasons. One, self-respect. I put a lot of time into this, and I want people to respect the work that we've done. And the second reason is ownership and investment. What I've known for 20 years is when people invest in something, they work at it. In the early days, I was like, oh, I have a big heart. I'm going to sell it really cheaply so everybody buys it. And people bought it and didn't listen to it. But cheap men out there, of whom I am one, I would use the word frugal. We paid, paid a couple hundred bucks for these. Maybe we should listen. There's something to that investment of I'm going to finally make the change. So here's the deal. Your handout is wrong. We do different pricing every night depending where we are. Casey sets the pricing. If we don't like the audience, they pay a little bit more. He <laughs> likes you. I'm not kidding. In New Jersey, they're paying full price. So it's the only place we get flipped off. Look, I'm being honest. I don't need your money, but I want the investment. So the uh, thing says, it says any five sets. It doesn't matter. We're not doing that. There's a calm uh, couples mentoring that's 297. Here's what he told me on the page. Get everything on this page. It's 10 programs plus there's a sibling fights one that is a, 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 a download only and the calm couples marriage one. We're doing everything for 179. So if you look on our website, it's more than that now, but everything we have is 179. If you need help financially, be assertive, ask Casey and say, can I do a couple payments? Can you help me out with that? Or we're laid off, or I'm uh, military, or we're both teachers, or whatever it is. I don't care. All I want is your investment, honestly. I don't care what it is. And ask Casey about that, and he will give you these in the little um, got calm bag, and then he will email you all the downloads, and you can share those with um, your parents who judge you. Um, <laughs> no, it's helpful, because parents are, are like that. So that was our little pitch, and that's why he was um, uh, controlling me. So if you're interested afterwards, see Casey for that. And if you can't do it tonight, you want a link to that, email us. We'll help you out. But I, I want people to have the tools because when you listen a lot, it gets it inside of you, and it's helpful. And there's a lot of stuff on there that we didn't get to. So let me finish with this one. Let me finish because I didn't get to things for uh, some of the older. Anybody have teenagers in here? And this will apply to the little kids, too, as they get a little bit older. But very quickly, because I didn't get to as many things with the teenagers, is internal motivation. I would encourage you uh, to write down the words mission and mentor. Um, we spend all of their lives trying to get them to care about school and behavior and all the things we want to care about. And if I was being, if we just were talking as family, I'd say, learn who your kids are. What motivates them? What are they curious about? Follow your child's curiosity because they're curious about things for a reason. Like, have you ever wondered this, why you're curious about certain things? You didn't choose it. You didn't, like, wake up and say, I think I'll be curious about this. You just have a natural inclination to be into cars or whatever it is. It's in there. And so I want to pull that out. And so here's the process. And even if you have toddlers, I would write this down and modify it because they're little. I would make a list of your child's natural gifts, talents, and passions. Because you know what everybody in here, when I get on a phone consultation, I get all the negative stuff, which I get. Tell me everything wrong with your child. I already know what it is. They don't follow directions. They don't get along with siblings. I name all those things. But my question is, what are they naturally good at doing? What brings them peace? Are they good at tinkering with things? Are they good at, do they like climbing? Um, wait, what was the... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the one that was a recent phone consultation. Such a great example. Um, it was a child. Um, I'm kind of drawing a blank, but he was very sensory and physical. And so you, you fix the difficult things using, by, by using what they're naturally good at doing. right? I, I, I use that to my advantage. And so I make a list of their gifts, talents, and passions. What are they good at doing? Think about this. Who do they connect well with? Do they get along with little kids? Or do they get along with animals or older people? And then second step, 
Find ways for your kids to use their natural gifts, talents, and passions outside the home, in the home too, but outside the home as much as possible, in school, community, church, neighborhood, whatever it is. Number three, accountable to another adult. I want the mission and a mentor, and you can use it for your toddlers. When your toddlers go into preschool, I want to talk to that teacher and say, here's, what's, here's what you're getting. You're getting a really bright, curious child who's probably not going to follow directions that well. But if you challenge my child or ask my child to fix th something or do something difficult, oh, you will see her eyes come alive. Help teachers know how to help your child. Does that make sense? So let me give you a couple uh, quick examples. So I had, a, um, uh, this is my favorite one, 12-year-old girl who had shut down just... Nah, don't want to do anything in life. Nah, I don't want to do my homework. Nothing's important to me. And so there's a mom sitting right over there at a live workshop, and she came up and she said, how can you help me with my daughter? Here are all the things that are wrong. And I said, I already know that. Okay, tell me this. What does she love doing? She likes soccer. Okay, that's one thing. Does she connect well with little kids? Yes, little kids love her. Okay, here's what I want you to do. And this was right after COVID kind of lifted last time. And so sports were happening again. I said, mom, I want you to go in your community and find a soccer coach who's teaching little kids. And here's what she did. She went up and said, I've got this daughter. She loves soccer, loves little kids. You look a little overwhelmed. Could she come out and help you at practice one night? And the coach was like, yeah, send her out. Her name was Rebecca. So on a Tuesday night, this girl who's not motivated, has a bad attitude, won't do anything, goes out to the soccer field because there was a coach who needed her help. If you can get the other adult to say, hey, I've heard you're good at soccer, I could use your help, they'll listen to the other person, but if it's your idea, pretty much going to shut down. So she goes out on this Tuesday night, helps out. At the end of the uh, uh, practice, guess what she gets? She gets hugs from six or seven little girls. Why? Because little girls love teenage girls because they're older and bigger. That night when Rebecca came home, do you think she had a bad attitude? No. She felt good because she could feel that gift being pulled out of her because those kids loved on her because she loves the kids and she likes soccer. So the coach says, you can come back uh, Thursday night and Saturday morning, we've got a game. I want you there. So she goes Saturday morning and she's in her element. How many of you, how many of you have older kids that play video games that your child, you're like, what are they going to do in life? But when you hear them on like Call of Duty 2 or a video game, you're like, my child's a leader. My child is controlling this whole... How many of you hear that at times? That's who your child is, right? For you, nothing. But then you hear them, you're like, my child's a leader. He's like, the, he's like leading the plan of attack and telling other people what true. And I want you to walk in sometimes and say, you know, when I hear you doing that, that's who you are. And one day when you grow up, you're going to be a leader because you don't follow directions. You got to lead, right? So... <laughs> Look, that's who they are. Why are we trying to keep trying to fit these kids into being someone? I wrote, I did a podcast late, late, uh, last week, I think, on I think I want to be a head of psychology, whatever, and come up with rule-following compliance disorder and label that a disorder for all the people who just do what everybody wants them to do. There's a lot of negatives to that, especially in Nazi Germany. Could have used some strong-willed people that said, nope, not going to do that. True? And in society, who do you think in, uh, invents cool things like iPhones? Think Steve Jobs was a joy to raise? <laughs> but how many of you are relying on that now? The rule followers didn't invent the iPhone. Now, you make sure that it ships on time, and that's important too, but you didn't invent it because he said, I'm going to invent something that has all the world's music on it, and I can access all the world's information while I'm driving on I-15, 65 miles per hour in the middle of the night, because otherwise it's too much traffic. But it takes a strong-willed person to do that. So on Saturday morning, she goes and works the game, and I'll end with this. You know what happened? Two sets of parents came up and said, Hey, Rebecca, my, my daughter, all she does is talk about you. She's struggling in school do you think you could tutor my daughter? Not knowing Rebecca had not done schoolwork for years. <laughs> but watch, now 
Rebecca has a reason to care about school. One, because she's accountable to help other kids, which she cares about. I don't care that mommy and daddy want me to do it. Screw you. She doesn't care. But I'll do it because these kids need me. Sorry, that was harsh, but it's true. And she did it because there was another adult who said, Rebecca, I want you here every week helping me with these kids. But if I hear from your parents that you're mouthing off and not keeping a B average and not doing your chores, you're not working with these little girls because I need a leader. And to that one person in her life, she says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. To her parents, uh, uh, you're stupid. And as a strong-willed child, as a parent, you have to look at that and say, that's what we're looking for. When she's in her element, she's awesome. Raise her for that. Put her in that element. Eventually, what will happen? Her attitude toward you will change because she finally feels good about herself because someone took the time to find what she cared about and put her in that situation instead of her whole life being, you're just a big disappointment because you can't do what everybody else is doing. Does that make sense? Start that early. I've got to close. It's 9.05. I wish I could go longer because I have passion for these kids and I want you to enjoy them. And that, I, I'll close on that. This week, enjoy the strong-willed child. The child that frustrates you, look, enter into their world. Stop fighting everything so much. Try this one time this week. Go and do something they're doing, like lay upside down off the sofa with them. And use this one phrase. You know what? I wish I was more like you. You see the world in a different way. You do things completely opposite of me. I wish I was more like you. Try that this week and see what happens. They're going to be like, really? Yeah, because I'm too rigid sometimes. And I want to apologize to you. Because it probably feels like I've never really been happy with you. And it's because I, I'm rigid. and Because I, this is all I've ever known. And it makes me uncomfortable that you don't have a lot of friends. Or you don't want to associate with a lot of friends. I know, but why does she have a lot of friends? Because she doesn't want to hang out with a lot of people, maybe. It's perfectly fine. I don't like hanging out with a lot of people. People are irritating. Have you not noticed that? If I lived here, I'd be friends with you. Probably, you're pretty cool. And dude back there. And that would be it. The rest of you, I'm not hanging out with you. I don't want to come to your stupid Christian get-togethers with all the people talking about brother and all the happy, crappy stuff. I want to get in real life and find out why would you just flip off your child last night? Because guess what I did? I did the same thing. And then we'll go to Prohibition, and we'll get hammered, and then we'll be good dads. I'm kidding about that. I don't even drink. Look, he's like, I'm on board with this parenting. <laughs> Best parenting conference I've heard. No, I don't want a lot of friends. I want to have deep friendships with a couple people. And some of your kids are like that. So uh, I went way off course. It was really good until then. So thank you for inviting us. Um, I'll stay and answer questions. Uh, if you want to come up and answer questions, if you need help with the CDs, ask Casey. He will help you out or just talk to him about your kids. But thank you uh, to our hosts for hosting us here. And um, anyway, hope we get to come back sometime. But thank you all very much and thanks for being patient. <laughs>